Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, where we speak about personal development and entrepreneurship. This is episode 117. Today, we are having a conversation with Sean Askinosi about his book, Meaningful Work, a quest to do great business, find your calling, and feed your soul. Now, 25 years ago, Sean was a successful criminal defense lawyer. Being a lawyer was his childhood dream, passed down from his father. He defended and won many high-profile cases which brought him fame and money. But the high pressure of his work lifestyle was unsustainable, and one day Sean woke up without motivation to continue and with an empty soul which was searching for a new meaning. In his quest to discover more meaningful work, he started volunteering in the palliative care wing of a hospital until one day he realized that what he really wanted to do was to create a chocolate company. Now keep in mind that up to this moment Sean had no experience whatsoever in the chocolate business. He created a chocolate company that sourced 100% of his cocoa beans directly from farmers across the globe and with whom he shared in an equitable manner all the profits. In addition to developing relationships with small farmers, he also partnered with the schools in their origin communities to provide lunch to 1,600 children every day without any outside donation. Now, in this episode, Sean described his quest to discover more meaningful work, his insights into doing work that reflects one's value and purpose in life. He shows how to create a work life that is inspired and fulfilling. Now, let's listen to the conversation. Sean, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. I look forward to our conversation. Sean, I found out about you because of your book, Meaningful Work, A Quest to Do Great Business, Find Your Calling, and Feed Your Soul, which was recommended by Seth Godin. And of course, your life is fascinating from getting into criminal law to quitting criminal law to not knowing what to do with your life and then building the chocolate business and even more helping a community and just empowering people to improve themselves. So I, we have so many things to cover and I just think everything is fascinating. Can we start with a little bit of your background? For example, how do you get into criminal law and a few of your life experience as a criminal attorney? I always wanted to be a lawyer. I think one of the ways that I got into it is because my father was a criminal defense lawyer and a civil rights lawyer. Uh, so I kind of grew up with it. It was a kitchen table discussion. And I went to the courthouse with him when I was a little kid and watched him try cases. And he died when I was 14. But I, I think I felt really inspired by him and his work. And so it's something that I always wanted to do. And, um, and so I did it. And I did it for about 20 years. And I specialized in very serious criminal cases uh, like murder and robbery and drug cases. And it was just the kind of thing. It didn't even really feel like work because I just loved it so much. I felt called to it. And um, but, you know, it's like a lot of things. Um, it ran its course. And in that kind of a job, when it runs its course, you can't phone it in, you, you know. So similarly, if you are a jet plane pilot, you know, a commercial airline pilot, if you no longer feel like that's your calling, you can't really phone that in. I mean, you got, you, you, you need to be fully, fully attentive. And, um, that's the way it was for me, but you know, I had death threats and, um, some of them were quite serious, um, to the point that my wife and I had to take some handgun training courses in order to be able to defend our home and learn about hostage taking scenarios in case my daughter was taken hostage uh, inside our home um, and that kind of thing. So it got pretty serious. 
uh, Sean, a lot of people go into law. Well, a lot of people that I know, maybe not the ones that you know, but I know a lot of people that go into law because they just want to make a lot of money. So they want the, the corner office, the fat paycheck, and to do the less threatenful or difficult work as possible. On the other hand, you chose a few of law that is not the highest paid and I find that the most difficult because you have people's life in your hand. Can you tell us a little bit of how or why you choose this sort of law? Well, um, for one, um, I, I found that um, in, my, in the very, very beginning of my career, I worked for a large, uh, a large law firm based in Dallas, Texas. And um, so I did uh, banking litigation and uh, those kind of things. And in the courtroom, I found that uh, I, I couldn't really get engaged in defending banks and things like that. It just wasn't interesting to me. And uh, the stakes were not that high. I mean, it had to do with money. And as you say, uh, when I was practicing criminal law, it was I literally had another person's life and freedom uh, in my hands to a large extent. And so it was just, um, it was much more, in my view, meaningful because it wasn't about money. It was about freedom. And I would say one, one thing I would slightly, um, correct you on in terms of the money. I didn't go into it for the money. Um, and criminal law typically is maybe not a field that people make a lot of money. But in the spirit of uh, truth and candor, I did make a lot of money. I made a lot of money. And I think one of the reasons I made a lot of money is because I was really good at what I did. And so toward the end of my career, I was uh, at the top of my game and people sought me out and um, my, my fees were high. Um, and um, I just kind of threw all that away. <laughs> Uh, and I will say that I do not make, uh, as a chocolate maker, what I made as a law, you're not even close, but, um, and you know, I made money, but I also did a lot of pro bono work, uh, to help people who were wrongfully accused or wrongfully convicted. I see. Okay. So you phone it in, you decide to quit and then what you are in a period of that you don't know what to do with your life. And I feel that a lot of creative and entrepreneurs find themselves in this corner of what do I do with the rest of my life? So can you tell us a little bit about your discovery that chocolate was your passion? Yes. The, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners can relate to this. I just said, that I loved what I did for almost 20 years. And then it was just like the light was turned off. And I was first having to understand, or at least wrestle with this notion, what is happening? Why is this happening? I've loved this for so long. What's going on? Why, why is this changing? And that was a very difficult experience. And this idea of going from one thing to another um, is even more challenging these days than it was when I did it 14 years ago. And when I did it 14 years ago, it was even more challenging than it would have been, say, 20 years before that. Why? Because we are bombarded with choices and opportunities and information all through technology. And so we can go to the Google search box and type what should I do with my life as I did even then? And unfortunately, the answer is not there. Um, it's not in a book. It's not in a podcast. And um, this notion of what should I do next is for many of your listeners, and it was for me, I'm sure, um, a, what, what a poet philosopher John O'Donohue describes as a threshold. And a threshold is an in-between place. And the in-between place is where uh, darkness often resides. Um, we can't seem to find our way. It's wilderness-like. And um, it's tough. It's hard. And the, one of the hard parts about being in the wilderness, or at least being in a kind of threshold like this, is you don't know how long it's going to last. And I didn't. And it took me five years to figure out what am I going to do? I was still practicing law. I'm still trying cases, still working hard, but I was desperately searching for some kind of passion and inspiration. And, uh, 
you know, finally chocolate came to me and, and, uh, I, I went about executing the steps to unwind my law practice and start my chocolate factory. Okay. <laughs> finally chocolate came to you. <laughs> But, <laughs> I mean, uh, the other, uh, creative and entrepreneurs, is that what will happen to them? Finally, their calling will arrive to them and they just sit patiently until it arrive or uh, I guess you search in Google and you couldn't find it and you were just patient enough. But is that the solution for the rest of us? Um, well, I should say it, it, it's um, the solution for some of us is, especially for us creatives and entrepreneurs, um, even um, um, entrepreneurs at heart. So if we have that sort of uh, motivated driven spirit to pursue and to, um, you know, seek the next thing, um, with passion, um, then the default setting for us is doing. And the doing can take many forms. As I said, searching Google, talking to your friends, listening to podcasts, reading books, reading more books, doing more research, talking to more people. And uh, pretty soon, uh, yes, the doing can yield results. Um, but often what I have found is that uh, people will um, jump to the next thing. And then pretty soon, three, five years later, they're back in the same position that they were. And so to your point of waiting patiently, I do think that there is uh, some um, sort of paradoxical process, which is both being and doing. So I think that the process by which we find our calling is perhaps um, a greater um, sense of being Um, than it is doing. And that's very challenging for us entrepreneurs. And there are these intersecting points between being and doing. And uh, that's where the mystery resides. And I think that's where it happens. And so to sort of go to the headline of this story, if you will, I do think it, 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 it it's a, I do think it's a matter of patience. I think it's a matter of accepting that the answer won't quickly come to us. But I think that not all of us, but for many of us, the answer to this question will come to us when we're in the act of service, if I could call it that, to other people or a person who needs us. And we're not in a place where we're expecting anything in return. And so Gandhi talked about this. Jesus talked about this. I mean, uh, others have talked about this notion where we sort of surrender ourselves to the need of another person or persons. And that is very counterintuitive to this idea of finding my way and finding my path. Um, but that's what did it for me. That's what did it for me. Okay, so when we talk about being on the service of other people or the community, then at that case, uh, the ambitious to, let's say, uh, make lots of money is, is not even in the top five priorities. It's just being of service, helping out, uh, improving our surrounding, and then hopefully along the way we also can crave out a living. Right. And I think that it's um, that there's even um, another layer which I would uh, peel back with you right now in the conversation. And that is it isn't about um, service in the sense of I'm the service provider and you're the recipient. Um, it actually is deeper than that. And it's called mutuality and uh, or it's called kinship. It's called compassion. And it's where I see myself in you and or in the group that I'm working with. And then to dive even deeper into the center of this mystery, if, 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 if one of your listeners were with us on the phone and struggling with this, I would ask one question of this person. And I would say, where does it hurt? Where is your heartbreak 
in your life. And now, can we find some place of service for you where there's a connection between the heartbreak in your life and this place of service? That is perhaps, I think, the deepest place of um, creativity, imagination, um, rebirth, and it's what John O'Donohue describes, you know, this process of going through a threshold, but I'm not saying that it's the end, but what I am saying, it's the other side of the threshold where we can so- sort of make out the horizon a little bit. And that's what happens. This is very, very counterintuitive because it, it's, it's not magic and it, it actually does kind of hurt. It's, it's uncomfortable. Wow. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. So chocolate found you. How did, um, how did he find you? And then what was your reaction when chocolate found you? For me, as I mentioned earlier, my dad died when I was 14. He had lung cancer and I helped take care of him. And, uh, it was really traumatic for me. He was my hero and, um, I was with him when he died. So fast forward 25 years, I decided to, um, work in the palliative care department of a hospital as a volunteer meeting with patients who were dying. And, um, I would just have conversation with them and I would end my visit by asking if they wanted me to pray for them. And, um, so I did that for almost five years and I'm not going to say that chocolate, the idea of chocolate just drifted to me while I was, you know, visiting with a patient. It wasn't like that at all, but the experience created a sort of clarity uh, for me. It opened spaces for me um, that I had not ever considered possible before. Why? Because there were times in that hospital that I believed I was in the right place at the right time in such a way that I'd never felt that before in my life, ever, really, or ever since. And uh, part of it had to do is because it was my own heartbreak. And Um, Khalil Gibran says that our greatest joy is our sorrow unmasked. And that's what happened to me. And so during those years is, you know, when I was driving in my car, this idea of chocolate, making chocolate from scratch came to me and I'd been working with chocolate. I didn't know where it came from. I was making desserts and cooking and still being a lawyer. And so then I went to the Amazon, uh, to study how farmers grow cocoa beans came back and started a one-year plan of, of uh, buying a building and, and taking on a partner to take over my caseload, and, and that's how it started. Well, and of course, your um, chocolate factory, one of the focus is to give back to the community, and, and I feel like chocolate has a bad, a bad reputation. We have heard articles about child slavery and abuse of farmers, and the farmers don't get paid enough. So in your case, you wanted to have chocolate. How did it come to you that not only you wanted to have chocolate, but you also wanted to serve the community? Why was this like a, a, one of the most important facet of your business? There are... This idea of making chocolate is really um, three vocations or three callings um, in one. The first one, I would say, is we want to make the best tasting chocolate that we can, the best quality chocolate we can make in the world. Well, that is supported by another calling, and the calling is working with farmers, working directly with farmers. In January, when I go to the Philippines, it'll be my 45th origin trip since I started the company. Um, I just was in Tanzania. And so I go to these places where we buy cocoa beans every year, and I meet with farmers, and I look at the crop and inspect the next shipment. We profit share with those farmers. We open our books to them. We translate our financials into their language so they can understand it. Um, And Over the last years that we've been buying cocoa beans, we've paid on average 55% more than the farmers would have otherwise received at their farm gate. And so working directly with farmers, I would say it's it's not about giving back. It's about including the farmers in 
our business in a way that is um, creating meaningful relationships with them. And of course, that ultimately over years impacts the quality of the bean. Um, and it's just the right thing to do. And we've never not done it. So it was always a part of this from the very beginning. And then the other thing I would say that supports this calling of making chocolate and working with farmers is working with students. We're, our chocolate factory started in a part of our community that is uh, impoverished, I should say, um, and near a homeless shelter. And so we started a program called Chocolate University, and we engage the elementary school, middle school, and high school students in our business. And in fact, the high school program, which we're just gearing up again, this is our 10th year, um, and we take local high school students in a business immersion summer school pro uh, program, and it's they learn all about Tanzania, language, culture, history, and then they go home and pack, and we take them to Tanzania to meet cocoa farmers. And we're actually in the selection process right now. So yesterday I interviewed students with our selection committee, and today I have another round of interviews, and tomorrow the final round, and we'll select students in this competitive program. And all of this is, um, if I could put it like this, it's not, although yes, I, I guess you could say it's giving back, but I don't really look at it that way because it's all mixed in together. It's just part of our business. It's part of our business model to work with students, to work directly with farmers, and to make chocolate. That's, that's just what we do and what we've always done. So one of the things I encourage companies to consider is to not silo the, the, the philanthropy or good works that they do into a department of their company um, separated from other departments. It should be, I think the good works that we do and the engagement in the community should run across all parts of our companies. Okay, one thing that I find astonished is uh, the process of making chocolate is quite simple. I mean, you put the your ingredients together, you mix it, and, and you know, you tweak it here and there, yet your company continues winning prizes for best chocolate ever. Is it, is it, is it the chocolate formula, or is it the love that uh, and appreciation that people put into your product because of all this goodwill that you are creating? What is it that makes you one of the best chocolate company in North America? Well, first of all, thank you for saying that. And, you know, this, what you just said, well, it means a lot to me. And, and uh, when I started, there were only two or three of us that were, you know, doing this in the North America. And um, we were starting after Scharfenberger started in San Francisco. And, and now there's, you know, between two and 300 um, chocolate makers. And it's always been my um, desire to, you know, continue to improve quality and to um, be competitive in this um, industry and to make really high quality chocolate. So thanks for mentioning it. The reason it's, 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 it's kind of like this. I'm so, um, we, we say here, it's not about the chocolate, it's about the chocolate. And what I mean is, well, we just talked for the last five minutes about, it's not about chocolate, it's about these programs with farmers and students and working with kids and, and in the community. Um, that's not about chocolate. But on the other hand, it is about chocolate because it's part of who we are, as I said. And so we're focused, complete, just laser focused on the quality and it it's all about this chocolate. We're, we're trying to come up with new recipes and better ways to roast the cocoa beans and um, just all of that. And so what I think is that the chocolate should always taste a little bit better than the good works that we do. So, for example, we're building a preschool in Tanzania in the village right now. It's, it should be open any week. Uh, or finished any week, and it's going to be open for 300 children in the village in January. Well, that's a kind of a big deal to build a preschool. And we're, we only have 17 people in my whole company, including me. So we're tiny. We always have been. But we're building this preschool. Well, that's a pretty cool thing, and that takes a lot. Well, that means that our chocolate needs to taste better than that. I know that may sound a little confounding, but that's the way I look at it. It has to taste better than that. Otherwise, 
if I take my eye off of that ball, eventually my chocolate will taste like sawdust and people will just be buying it because they think we're a cool company. And I don't want Okay, so it sounds like uh, you are a busy guy. You have all this uh, traveling and run, taking care of the business and going from Tanzania to Amazon and this and that. Yet mm -hmm. you cry, carve out the time to sit down and write this book. And this book has been very inspirational. Uh, I can, you know, I can follow you. Mm, Thread of thinking from a defense attorney to where you are now. So, what inspired you to write this book? The it, the book took about three years to write, and my daughter Lauren is my co-author, and she's our chief marketing officer and my partner, and and uh, she's a gifted writer and really helped me with this. But um, I think the idea of writing the book was around for a while. But I felt kind of intimidated because I didn't really think I had anything to say. Um, and now what I've come to realize is that, you know, in my book, there's basically no original thought. Um, and, and I do a lot of reading myself. I read a lot. And I think that there isn't a lot of original thought. There's some, of course, around these days. But, but what I do think and I've really just come upon this recently, is that we're, even though I don't really have anything new to say, it's possible that someone might connect with me our, or our story and thereby be exposed to these ideas and these philosophies for the first time, even though they're not new. That's why um, I, I wrote this. And it was it was that combined with You know, can we, in our own small way, contribute to this larger notion of what's happening with capitalism now in the world? You know, can we provide a little, just a little um, illumination with others and join with them? That's that's why why we wrote the book. Okay, well, tell us where we can find the book and, and, and how can people follow you or find you or follow your story or the work that you are doing. Thank you. The, um, the book is available online at your um, favorite bookseller online or also in some shops. And so I would just say Google Meaningful Work and my name, Askenosi, and people can Find us and learn about us on our website, um, askinosie.com, A-S-K-I-N-O-S-I-E. And I have a blog at seanaskinosie.com that I try to keep up with and write about these things that you and I have been talking about today. And um, our chocolate is available in stores in the United States and some in Canada. Uh, is there anything that I neglected to ask you? Not that I can think of, unless you can think of something. No, I just would have liked to spend one hour in each particular facet of your life. But uh, uh, we will let the reader find out about that when they buy their book. That sounds good. And if we can ever talk again, I would love to do it. Okay. Thank you so much, Sean, for your time. Well, thank you for having me. Wow. I'm so full of gratitude, Sean, for you coming over to the podcast and sharing your life experience with us. It was extremely motivating and inspiring. And well, you promised me that if I ask you for another podcast episode, you will say yes. So I'm going to hold you to that promise. And within, I don't know, 12 months or so, I'm going to see how is it going for you. Now, for the listeners, I strongly encourage you to check out his book. It is full of valuable life lessons and inspiration. You will feel like going out and doing something good for yourself and for the people around you. Finally, please connect with Sean. I'm putting in the show notes all his contact information. And while you are at it, uh, please connect with me as well. Let me know that you listen to the podcast. I'm available in LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So whichever platform you prefer, just send me a message and say, hey, I'm lying. I'm a podcast listener. Nice to connect with you or something of that matter. And finally, that's it. I'll talk to you next week. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye.